Good morning, everybody here in Frankfurt on campus west end of Goethe University. On behalf of SAFE, um, the research center here at, the, at that place and CPR, I welcome you for um, a policy lecture here in the, in the early morning. Um, I'm very happy and pleased to welcome Fabio Panetta, who stands right next to me. Um, and uh, he will give a lecture that hopefully gives some light, sheds some light on the new developments on the monetary front that we all expect now nervously to happen over the next couple of months and where the details are still vague, I would say, or not known and uh, the consequence is not spelled out. So I'm really curious to hear what uh, Fabio has to say. So first of all, um, my welcome to everybody. Uh, let me say a few words um, about um, Fabio Panetta, who is an, a member of the executive board of ECB since the 1st of January 2020. Um, he has a, a portfolio that um, includes international and European relations, market infrastructure, payment, banknotes, so a lot of issues that relate to the, the, um, the foreign policy, I would say, of the ECB and also of the technical side of the working of the system. I think this is important for today's topic. Um, Fabio Panetta has been serving um, at the Bank of Italy for many years, 20, almost 20 years before joining ECB in various roles, um, eventually as the senior, senior deputy governor. Um, Fabio is also an academic researcher, so he has published uh, a lot of um, articles and papers in journals that I also value very highly in my discipline. I think we are close in the topics that you have been doing over, over the year. Uh, your, um, your academic part of your career, um, both on corporate finance, capital market, and macroprudential policy. Um, Fabio has, has a PhD from a London Business School and a master from LSE, so the postgraduate studies were in London and the graduate studies in Louis, at Louis in, in Rome. So let me shift a bit to the topic itself. Um, I would, although outside this room, it is so silent and the sun is shining, it's a nice spring day. Uh, the atmosphere in my head when I open the newspaper is rather wild. You have multiple crises that, uh, that also interact and that put a lot of dynamics to the development uh, in the economy and particularly also concerning expectations of what, what will happen. There's the pandemic with its consequences on global trade and also consequences on fiscal capacity. There is the war in the Ukraine, the sanctions, the energy price explosion, the supply chain interruptions, maybe global food crises looming. There's the climate change and the actions against it with big public investments and, uh, that are required. There is the geopolitical innovation, I would say, the, the resurfacing of uh, military um, spending. And there is inflation that suddenly picked up. So all this mixes is a big cocktail that is not easy to understand intellectually. And then this morning, as I said, the sun is shining. It look, looks like a nice day. We have uh, talk about the normalization of monetary policy. So I really wonder how you may, may, will square the circle between this chaotic mix of developments and then how normalization really looks like. In any case, um, I'm very interested. I think the audience is interested as well. And uh, I leave the floor to you, Fabio. Thank you, Professor Kranner. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good morning, everybody. And let me first of all, thank you for uh, this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in this fantastic uh, location in this beautiful uh, sunny day. As Ian mentioned, uh, in the past I have been involved in uh, research. So I know very well how important it is to subject our uh, analysis, our reflections, to the rigor and the consistency that comes from 
a dialogue with uh, uh, academics and researchers. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, as Ian mentioned, I will uh, address today the issue of normalization. Following the ac acute uh, phase of the pandemic, central banks in most advanced economies have started to withdraw stimulus as the recovery has progressed and deflationary pressures have emerged. In the jargon of uh, central bankers, this process is often described as bringing about a normalization of monetary policy. We are not, however, in normal times. Unlike some other advanced economies, the euro area is not facing a situation of excess domestic demand. As ECB president Christine Lagarde recently noted, I'm quoting, consumption and investment remain below their pre-crisis levels and even further below their pre-crisis trends. Instead, the euro area is confronted with a war on its doorstep that comes on top of a series of negative supply shocks generated abroad. These shocks, above all the increase in energy prices, are creating sizable and persistent upward pressures on near-term inflation. By hitting real incomes, confidence, and ultimately domestic demand, these shocks could derail the post-pandemic recovery. In other words, the very shocks that have led to a surge in inflation are also depressing output. As a result, the inflation path is starting from a much higher point, but the medium-term inflation outlook is characterized by high uncertainty. In this situation, policy normalization needs to be clearly defined, and how it is carried out needs to be carefully judged and calibrated. In my remarks today, I will outline what it means to normalize monetary policy, what implications this normalization has for our policy instruments and how far it should go. For now, given the exceptional level of uncertainty we face, we should normalize our monetary policy gradually in line with the progressive adjustment that has inspired our action in recent months. Let me begin by defining what normalization is and what it is not. Normalization occurs when the central bank adjusts its policy parameters as a medium term inflation, as medium term inflation approaches its price stability objective, so as to achieve this objective durably. In other words, normalization describes a situation in which monetary policy is shifting from a stance that aims to raise the inflation path for example, by making the policy stance more expansionary to one that aims to cement inflation, the inflation path at the target. There are three important distinctions we need to make about normalization. First, normalization is not the same thing as a neutral policy stance, which is when monetary policy is neither accommodative nor contractionary for the economy. A neutral stance allows the central bank to stabilize inflation around its target when output is at potential and when there are no transitory shocks disrupting the inflation path. But if we have a situation where there are shocks depressing the economic outlook, uncertainty is high and output is still below its potential level, cementing the inflation path at 2% would require a gradual withdrawal of accommodation so that the stimulus is reduced over time, but does not suddenly disappear. Second, the normalization process should not be assessed against the unobservable reference points, such as the natural or neutral rate of interest and some optimal or normal size and composition of the central bank's balance sheet in the long run. These concepts, the natural rate and the optimal uh, size and composition of the balance sheet, um, are only vague guideposts at best of times, and they are particularly fraught with uncertainty in the current environment. Before the pandemic, the real natural rate of interest for the euro area was estimated to range for, from just over zero to less than minus 2%, depending on the models used. In fact, proxies of real rates are already at the higher end of that range. For instance, the one-year forward real rate, nine years ahead, 
recently increased significantly, reaching zero. But the natural rate of interest is particularly hard to estimate at the moment. All we can say with confidence is that estimates are imprecise and widely dispersed. As such, they cannot serve as an actual guide for policy. The picture is further clouded when it comes to the normal size and composition of the central bank's balance sheet. It is unlikely that the prevailing size and composition prior to the global financial crisis are still valid benchmarks, but there has so far been little empirical work in this area so that it cannot serve as an actual guide for policy either. This uncertainty means we should think about normalization in terms of changes in the degree of accommodation we are providing based on the medium term inflation outlook, rather than the distance of our policy tools from unobservable theoretical levels. So if we were to see shocks that would lead to medium term inflation path being revised upwards, we would change our policy stance to reduce accommodation more rapidly and vice versa, so as to keep inflation on target over the medium term. Third, normalization does not imply adjusting unconventional instruments more rapidly than conventional ones. In the review of the ECB's monetary policy strategy that we completed last year, we were clear that both types of instruments are essential and permanent components to our toolkit. What matters is finding the combination of tools to deliver the necessary policy stance in the most effective and proportionate way. And the uh, uh, necessary policy stance is one that leads us in the medium term to, to our 2% target. In the ECB's case, we currently have three main levers we uh, can, in principle, use to adjust policy. The first is interest rates. The second is asset purchases, and the third is the provision of liquidity through our targeted long-term uh, refinancing operations, the so-called TLTROs. Sorry for this very bad acronym. Various combinations could be used to achieve the desired policy stance. For instance, if we bring net asset purchases to an end, but continue to reinvest the stock of assets purchased, our balance sheet will keep supporting the economy through what is known as the stock effect, but it will no longer provide additional accommodation. So the appropriate stance could in principle involve maintaining a constant stock of assets purchased under our asset purchase program, APP, and pandemic emergency purchase program, the so-called PEPP. At the same time, we would be using interest rates to adjust the degree of policy accommodation. Even if the goal of normalization is relatively straightforward, calibrating this policy normalization process in the Euro area today is extraordinarily complex. In my view, there are two principles we need to apply to orient the normalization process correctly. The first is gradualism, and the second is robustness. These principles, gradualism and robustness, in turn, help us to define the pace of normalization and the mix of instruments. As William Brainerd proposed in his seminal work, gradualism is necessary when the transmission of policy changes to the economy is uncertain. Gradualism is clearly appropriate in the Euro area today for several reasons. First, the nature and strength of recent shocks is generating extreme uncertainty about uh, the outlook for economic activity in the period ahead. The economy has faced a series of negative global supply shocks in the form of surging energy and commodity prices compounded, compounded by supply bottlenecks. The Russian invasion of Ukraine and zero COVID policies in China are now prolonging and amplifying these shocks, which are all contributing to very high imported inflation. The higher cost of imports in turn, is eating into domestic demand and pulling production away from full capacity, reinforcing the world's negative impact on confidence. It is hard to gauge how far reaching and persistent the implications of the hit to euro area consumer and business confidence will be. 
The weakening in consumption registered this year suggests that the rise in near-term inflation expectations is not prompting uh, consumers to bring purchases forward. Rather, it is leading households to be more pessimistic about their real income and to reduce their consumption. We may also be underestimating the full impact on global growth of the simultaneously, simultaneous tightening of financing conditions across advanced economies, coupled with the slowdown in China. A recent survey suggests that global growth optimism has collapsed to record lows. The second reason why gradualism is appropriate is that we can only truly gauge the effects of the withdrawal of accommodation by getting feedback from the economy. This means not only monitoring soft lending indicators, soft leading indicators like inflation projections and expectations or confidence indicators, but also assessing hard data on financial conditions and economic activity. As a result, we will have to move step by step, reassessing and adjusting our policy as necessary. In an environment where leverage in the economy is high, small rate increases might have larger effects. During the pandemic, demand has largely been concentrated in sectors that are sensitive to interest rates, such as durable goods and construction. This could mean that rate increases will have a sizable effect on demand. The considerable uncertainty surrounding how monetary tightening will be transmitted through broader financial conditions and across the euro area is another reason why we should take small steps. Typically, at cyclical turning points, financial markets become more volatile and banks' lend lending policies are more difficult to forecast. In the euro area, this latter effect, the difficulty to forecast bank, uh, banks' lending policies, is reinforced by the phasing out of our uh, uh, long-term refinancing operations. Of course, a gradual approach is not appropriate in all circumstances. For example, when faced with deflationary shocks that risk rooting uh, interest rates at the lower bound, it pays to act more decisively. Likewise, if we were to see clear signs of a de-anchoring of medium-term inflation expectations, we would accelerate the pace of withdrawal of accommodation, and we could go further and adopt a restrictive stance if necessary. For now, we do not see ugly uh, inflation scenario materializing. Ugly inflation is inflation uh, that is not the consequence of growth, but which is depressing growth. Inflation that does not uh, emerge because the economy is running hot, but inflation that emerges for different reasons and has a negative effect on economic activity. We do not see this ugly inflation uh, scenario materializing, but the risks need to be monitored. Currently, premium adjusted market-based measures of inflation expectations are consistent with inflation meeting our 2% target at the end of 2024 and being slightly below 2% from 2025 onwards. Turning to the second principle, robustness, we need to choose the mix of instruments that is most robust to the wide range of plausible scenarios we are facing. This calls for us to avoid normalizing our monetary policy using all instruments at once in order to minimize uncertainty and reduce the risk of financial stability being negatively affected. The natural way forward would be to start raising rates while keeping the stock of assets purchased under the APP and PEPP constant. This seems the most appropriate approach for a number of reasons. First, the size of, of our balance sheet is already expected to significantly shrink and its composition will change as the TLTROs, our long-term refinancing operations, are wound down, ultimately leading to a reduction of around 2.2 trillion in excess liquidity. Second, we do not need to risk unsettling financial markets through a passive runoff or active sales of bonds we hold on our balance sheet, given that we could proceed with the unnecessary withdrawal of accommodation in other ways. Starting to reduce the stock of assets purchased under the APP and PEPP would likely exacerbate the impact of rate changes, both along the yield curve and on risk premium, especially if liquidity is declining. 
Third, although we have plenty of experience of how asset purchases and policy rates can reinforce each other as part of an easing strategy, we have no experience on the reverse scenario in the Euro area. And the experience of other major central banks, limited as it is, is unlikely to be transferable to the Euro area given the unique nature of economic, financial, and institutional setup in the Euro area. In this context, we will be much more able to anticipate the consequences of gradually adjusting rates while keeping our balance sheet constant. Using policy rates to withdraw accommodation thus allows us to better calibrate the adjustment that is consistent with 2% inflation over the medium term. This reduces the risk of an overcorrection that would durably depress the economy. And at the same time, it allows us to move faster if the risk of second round effects starts to materialize. Tightening policy through rate changes would also be simpler for us to communicate and easier for the general public to understand, reinforcing confidence and the anchoring of inflation expectations at our target. So what does this imply for the ECB's normalization process today? Subject to incoming data, we are and we should remain data dependent. Uh, both the economic outlook and the principles I have outlined justifying ending net asset purchases and then gradually exiting negative rates. This would allow us to continue to normalize policy by removing the part of our monetary accommodation that is no longer needed today. In particular, negative rates may imply distortions which were only necessary and proportionate when inflation was threatening to be too low over the medium term relative to our target. The first adjustment, the adjustment in our uh, uh, net purchases is already underway. We have already signaled our expectation that net asset purchases would be concluded in the third quarter of this year. At the same time, the stock effects associated with our investment policy will ensure that accommodation is withdrawn gradually. This will avoid creating financial stability risks in an already very volatile and uncertain environment. The second adjustment, the adjustment to our deposit facility rate, would allow the recent rise in medium term inflation expectations to be reflected in our monetary policy. It would be consistent with a progressive removal of accommodation, still allowing us to steer output back to, towards its potential, but confirming the direction of normalization that has already led to an increase in rate expectations. By the time we consider the next steps, we will have more information on which to base our decisions. In particular, we will have a better sense of how two key uh, variables will develop. First, the sensitivity of the economy to the significant adjustment in financing conditions that is already underway, so we can gauge whether the pace at which we are withdrawing accommodation is appropriate. We have already seen a material increase in nominal rates and real rates in recent months. In fact, an adjustment is already working its way through the economy. And according to our latest bank lending survey, banks expect to tighten credit conditions markedly in the coming quarters. The second key development will be how resilient the domestic economy is to the combined impact of the war, lower real incomes, and a darkening global outlook. So far, we are seeing a clear weakening of soft leading indicators. Signs of economic stress are emerging in the hard data as well. Against this background, pre-committing to further steps, just like ruling them out, seems unnecessary and unwise. The uncertainty we are facing makes it harder to accurately forecast economic developments beyond short time horizons. Given these circumstances, speculating about monetary policy measures over an extended period of time would be, in my view, a futile exercise at this stage. Finally, a critical element in the determining the normalization process will be how rate increases are transmitted across the Euro area. In this respect, ensuring monetary policy is transmitted smoothly and evenly and delivering the adequate degree of policy normalization are two sides of the same coin. And this is not a new concept for the European Central Bank. During the recovery, 
from the global financial crisis, the European Central Bank applied a separation principle to its various policy tools, whereby measures that prevented financial fragmentation could be deployed regardless of the level of interest rates. The logic was that delivering the appropriate policy stance should not come at the cost of disrupting the transmission of the stance to the financial sector. I believe a similar principle should apply today. In particular, we should be ready to intervene as needed to neutralize any non-linear market responses that may arise from raising rates and to mitigate the impact of an asymmetric tightening of financing conditions within the euro area. In other words, we should avoid the risk of a normalization tantrum. An anti-fragmentation tool of this nature would be even more beneficial if we were to see incipient signs of a de-anchoring of inflation expectations or risks of a wage price spiral. These are the so-called uh, second round effects. Uh, de-anchoring of inflation expectations and uh, excessive growth of wages. We should thus ensure that we are in a position to credibly announce the availability and readiness of such an anti-fragmentation tool. In other words, addressing fragmentation risk is central to the normal conduct of monetary policy in the euro area. At the same time, the successful implementation of the national investment and reform plans under the next generation EU program remain critical to support macroeconomic resilience thereby also addressing fragilities that increase fragmentation risks. And joint European investments to reduce energy dependence would help cushion the effects of the idiosyncratic shocks that may result from the war. Let me conclude. <clears throat> the European Central Bank is currently dealing with the economic effects of an unprecedented sequence of shocks generated abroad. Like other major central banks, we are faced with the task of normalizing monetary policy at a point in time that is anything but normal. In this difficult situation, we will guarantee medium-term price stability, just like we protected the euro area economy from deflation during the pandemic. Normalization does not mean removing stimulus outright. Rather, it is a process of gradually reducing that stimulus in a way that firmly anchors the inflation path at 2% over the medium term. This process has already got underway in the euro area. Getting normalization right is no easy task as the euro area economy must contend with an outlook that is marked by exceptional uncertainty. This means that we should normalize our monetary policy gradually and choose a mix of instruments that is robust to the wide range of plausible scenarios we could face. This, these tried and tested principles have proved instrumental for central banks in the past. We should remain true to them today. Thank you very much. So th thank you very much, Fabio. That was uh, very interesting and very much to the point. So um, I want to remind our audience that they can put up questions in the Q&A or Frage und Antwort section in the um, uh, those that are participating in a, in a hybrid way. And we will try to bring them forward here in the audience. And of course, also the audience here in the room is uh, invited to, to ask questions. But maybe I take the, uh, the, the chance to ask a, a first question. So the, the, the issues that I took from your speech as very interesting to me. One is that the orientation towards um, a natural rate this whole concept that in the academic literature plays such an important role will not be the guiding principle of what, what you're doing. That's what I took from, from your words. So you're, you are rather, I would say, advocating a pragmatic approach. Uh, that is also the term gradualism would, be, would imply you, you go small step by small step and look what the consequences are. So it looks also a bit like experimentation. Would that be also an interpretation of this gradualism? 
um, trying out what it means to reduce the stock of assets, for instance, or is there already, let's say, a clear uh, expectation that the stock of asset purchased will remain as it is uh, if there is an, um, a re let's say, a reverse of the purchasing um, well, direction? I, I, well, thank you very much. You, know, you summarized very nicely uh, the basic concepts that I wanted to transmit in my, in my presentation, my introduction. Uh, two things. Uh, first, um, the natural rate as many concepts in economics is a very useful uh, way of reasoning about our normalization, but should not be an operational guide. Uh, we don't know where the, the natural rate is. We don't know how to estimate in a precisely, uh, in a precise way. It is uh, time changing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think we can really base our day, uh, today uh, monetary policy uh, on uh, this very vague and unobservable concept. And after all, we have a mandate and we are uh, targeting uh, inflation. We have a mandate to, to get to price stability, not to target the, the natural rate. So the natural rate is a concept that we have in mind, like many others. And I don't think it, it uh, de facto can uh, represent an operational uh, guide. Uh, on um, the specifics, uh, balance sheet, on, uh, as I said, uh, if I now uh, ventured into you know, uh, forecasts on uh, the size of the balance sheet, the level of interest rates, I think I would be unwise. While we never faced a situation like this, in which we have been for a prolonged phase uh, with negative rates, with a very large balance sheet, we, uh, I've never uh, done a monetary policy during a war. I've never been through a pandemic in my life. I've never done monetary policy through a pandemic. Uh, we don't know how the economy will react after such a prolonged period of, of uh, you know, uh, supply shocks. Uh, we don't know how it will uh, weather the, the increase in, uh, in uh, energy prices is temporary, it's permanent, how the economy should. So there are so many things going on at once that my I'm also sorry because it's so obvious. My message was, let's be careful. Mm -hmm. Let's not go too far before we understand that it is the wrong direction. Let's try to be pragmatic. Let's try to look at what happens once we start administering the, 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 the medicine to the economy, and then let's adjust on the basis of this uh, mm -hmm. experience. We have never seen a, a, a tightening phase in which you shrink the balance sheet, you reduce the size of the balance sheet, and increase rates, but we haven't seen it uh, also in other countries. So we have no experience. Uh, I think it would be really, uh, it is really unnecessary now to add to the shocks we have seen to the economy, additional shocks which are really undecidable and unworthy. Yeah. yeah, so may maybe if I can just uh, follow up a little bit on this. Uh, so in, in, in my understanding, if you start to reduce the stock of assets in your portfolio, if you would start to do this, there may be consequences um, on the sovereign debt market in terms of spread development. Would that be a, an aspect that you observe closely and that would be, uh, let's say, also a target to, and I know that in earlier times, there was the target to keep the spreads relatively close um, among European countries. No, we, we never target the spreads. We never target the spreads. Okay. Uh, no, I, what I'm saying is that um, financial markets and sovereign debt markets uh, 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 are no exception, are subject to multiple equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it would be too risky in this phase, in which we face a recovery that is still fragile because we are still seeing the effects of past shocks. It would be uh, imprudent to give to, to the economies several medicines at once. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the institutional setup in the euro area, I think that the, the uh, normalization through interest rates is uh, the most prudent way to rein in inflation. Our objective here is to bring inflation back in a durable way to 2%. And in order to do that, I uh, think it would be uh, uh, preferable to do this with a tightening of interest rates as necessary going forward, looking at the conditions, looking at the, 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 the impact of the reduction in disposable income uh, determined by the higher import prices, looking at the number of indicators and then you know, reacting to, to developments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so so keep it tractable in, in a way. The point. So I think we we collect a few questions here in the room, and then I have a, a list of questions in in the chat. So maybe um, Jan, you will start. Uh, thank you very much for being here and for also explaining. Um, I very much like that you want to further study before you prescribe medicine. And when we talk about inflation, we very often just say, "Oh, keep inflation at two percent." But what actually is inflation? Isn't inflation something a lot more heterogeneous? So like I live in a small apartment here in Frankfurt. I don't own a car. Um, I do not have to spend much on, on energy to keep my house warming. I'm not touched much by inflation. But as someone who lives on the countryside, who has to commute to work a lot, who really depends on the car, who maybe has a larger house, they spend a lot. So inflation is something extremely heterogeneous, um, also within countries, also within cities. Um, within lifestyles. And um, I would certainly not blame the ECB now for the inflation figures that we see here. I mean, I would blame Putin. I mean, it is a consequence of the war. Um, and um, I would like to ask you more from a scientific or academic point of view, how can you communicate maybe and study a little bit better like this heterogeneity in inflation and uh, the way this is experienced by consumers? Well, thank you for this question because I think it's a very important question. Um, you're right. Uh, we have uh, discussed, I have discussed inflation today as if inflation is one thing for everybody. Of course, we face different uh, uh, um, uh, degrees of, of reduction in our uh, um, real disposable income, depending on our consumption basket, on the location of our apartment, whether we have a car or not. Uh, and the, but the monetary policy is a blunt instrument for these issues. And uh, we cannot uh, um, uh, have any impact on relative prices. What you are saying is that there is a change in relative prices. The, the, the price of uh, benzene is going up relative to the price of, I don't know what, uh, other, other uh, uh, goods which, uh, or services which have not been affected by the increase in, uh, in uh, oil prices. That is the role of fiscal policies. And fiscal policies are intervening in uh, the member states. There is also another dimension that could go uh, more deeply into the uh, different heterogeneous effects that uh, the increase in inflation is determining, which is market potential policies. Another issue is that in some countries, house prices are increasing. In other countries, they are not. So we are, uh, the, 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 the objective of the ECB is to stabilize the general price level. 2% inflation per year in the medium term. If there is an increase in specific assets or in specific goods, then you could intervene, for example, in the case of assets with market potential policies that can be national, can be more targeted. In principle, they could be as targeted as government wanted them to be. So you're right, inflation, and we should uh, communicate very clearly on this. I've tried to do it in the past. I will uh, do it again because uh, we will uh, do the utmost and we will we will bring the inflation to 2% in the medium term. Um, but uh, uh, I cannot guarantee that uh, the cost of benzene at the pump will go down because that depends on something else. That you should ask, as you mentioned, to Mr. Putin. And uh, if Mr. Putin decides that uh, he's supplying less oil and less gas to the Euro area, then prices would go up and uh, even government cannot do anything about that. They can intervene with selected targeted instruments to alleviate uh, the burden, the cost, the impact on uh, specific categories. But this is not the role of monetary policy. And this is not the role of, of monetary policy because we couldn't do it. Monetary policy cannot intervene at the micro level, cannot intervene on relative prices. But you're right, we should do as much uh, as possible to communicate and to explain people. Because I understand that many, are upset about the fact that they have to use their car. They have to uh, use uh, heating in their apartments and they are upset. And of course, the central bank is very visible. It's a, the natural scapegoat. But uh, you know, we should explain why this is not the case, why the central bank is doing its job, but some states of nature do not depend from central banks. So I take a question from, oh, there's a second one. Yeah, please then take this one. And while you are preparing, I just take one from the chat so that everybody has a chance to participate. So I have two questions in the opposite direction and both are asking whether a 50 basis point increase of the interest rate would be suitable in one direction or the other. 
So one said, is it too no. much? One I, the other says, not you know, the, the, what the, is now required the, because the, the situation is so awkward. The pleasure of being in an academic environment is that you can do economic analysis and reasoning without being uh, forced to discuss uh, the basis points and dates. So I'm not going to get into this discussion today. I, I wanted to communicate that uh, some of the exceptional policies we have used in the past are not necessary anymore. When and how quickly and in which steps corrections will take place is a discussion that we do in the governing council. I'm not going to do it today. I'm sorry. That's fine, but I, we have taken up the question. So now it's your turn. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much for your explanations. Uh, I have uh, another question on uh, the financial conditions because you mentioned the side of the inflation expectations, financial conditions in the euro area are quite essential for the policy direction. And uh, as was already asked, um, the financial markets certainly play an important role here. And we have seen in the recent months that the government bond spreads have widened quite substantially, not to unprecedented levels, but they have been quite elevated lately. So for instance, the Italian bond uh, is two percentage points higher than the sovereign bond uh, compared to the German one. So my question is, uh, I just wanted to clarify because I didn't exactly understand uh, your answer. That, that clear, uh, my question is whether really the central bank prioritizes inflation expectations over financial conditions in the financial markets, or in other words, what would happen if the spread on Italian sovereign bonds would go to four or five percentage points, like in, you know, in, the, in the crisis in 2012-13. Um, would the central bank react on that with their policy tools, or would they still focus mainly on inflation expectations, especially if those would rise further to, I think they are now around 2.3%, the market-based inflation expectations, which are not that far above the two percentage points medium term goal, but if they would go simultaneously to three or three and a half percent, and then you have these, you know, two uh, somewhat contrary um, uh, situations uh, occurring. No, I, I would question that uh, these two objectives are at odd with each other. Uh, because uh, the um, criterion that we use is whether there is any development in uh, financial markets that impedes us to uh, do monetary policy and uh, acts against the transmission of our monetary policy in the entire euro area. So in this sense, uh, avoiding uh, disorderly, nonlinear increases, uh, multiple equilibrium in financial markets in general is uh, something which would make our, uh, uh, the transmission of our monetary policy weaker and possibly uh, would impede the transmission of monetary policy. So uh, maintaining orderly conditions in financial markets is essential to uh, do monetary policy. So in order to stabilize inflation expectations, in order to uh, keep under control inflation dynamics in the middle term, we must, must transmit the impulses of our monetary policy. And those impulses work mainly through financial markets. So we control short-term interest rates now. Uh, we are not, uh, in the future, we will not be buying anymore. And through interest rates, short-term interest rates, we transmit through the yield curve, through financial markets, the impulses of our policy. And we cannot have uh, financial markets going in all directions. So the, the criterion, the, 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 the benchmark is monetary policy transmission. And uh, in order to transmit monetary policy, we must guarantee orderly market conditions. Uh, yeah, uh, Tatiana. So Tatiana Farinasi. So thank you, Fabio, for the excellent presentation. Um, my question is the following. It, through time, there is sort of a, a, a change in mandates of central banks, right? And, uh, and, and of focus as well. So in the last years, there was you know, a lot of focus again on financial stability. And my sense is that in the very recent years, there were uh, more things that sort of uh, fell under the central bank umbrella, even if not in the, the official mandate. And I think my sense is that's also true for the ECB. So for instance, climate issues came um, as 
as a topic that central banks often address and that we've had, we have heard the, the ECB often addressing. And my question is, um, does, does that make it harder for the central bank to deal with, with, with um, its main mandate, which is the one you've been focusing on today? Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, the climate changes can make uh, monetary policy more complicated. Uh, of course, not in the very short run, we are not there yet, but uh, looking ahead, it is clear that um, the uh, severe um, disruptions which can uh, hit the economy due to uh, 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 climate events can have an impact on conjunctural and structural development. Just to make you an example, uh, a few years ago, there was a, a, a anomalous um, number of industrial production in Germany. I was coming at that time commuting from Italy and I was stuck in Frankfurt because a huge snowfall and they, they, nobody in the construction sector could work because the ground was too, too, too hard. Then had we not taken into account that it was due to a climate event, we would have uh, uh, perceived that as a slowdown in the economy. We, we must take into account extreme events and the impact and the correlation between climate events and the economy. And this, according to all scientists, are going to become more and more frequent. The impact of uh, extreme uh, climate events on the economy will become, unfortunate unless we, we stop this uh, deterioration in, in the uh, environmental conditions in, uh, in, uh, uh, at the global level, this will become a much more frequent phenomenon. So, uh, in the in, in the you know, very short run, in our day by day today, until you know, I'm I've been speaking today in the, something which refers to the next uh, uh, six months. I hope nothing will happen. But uh, looking uh, further ahead over the medium to long term, of course, we have to take into account uh, 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 climate changes very seriously. <clears throat> if I can just add a little bit on this question, <clears throat> so it's the issue that we have so many. Let's say tasks that have been given to the ECB over the years. Also, because after the financial crisis, there was no real fiscal response that was, uh, let's say, um, coordinated enough. <clears throat> now, ECB took over in, in a certain sense to rescue uh, the economy in these years and has ever since stayed at the very responsible, in a very responsible role. So, we have heard several things. There's this climate issue. There is this fragmentation or anti-fragmentation issue. I'm drawing on a question here in the in the chat um, that that has also been used at times to um, explain policy matters. Now the inflation issue comes up very prominently, also in speeches of your your colleagues over the last couple couple of days. Um, so. How do you go about the trade-off between these different uh, objectives if they yeah. arise? Is that no, uh, managing uh, trade-offs, or is there a lexical? No, we, we we don't. I don't perceive them as a, a, a being part of a trade-off with uh, monetary policy. Uh, we take into account today more than in the past climate changes. We take into account today more than in the past the impact of a pandemic simply because now we, we are seeing climate changes because we did have a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we take into account the risk of fragmentation because we saw that fragmentation uh, leads us in a situation which would be impossible to implement our monetary policy. So uh, the world is changing and there are new uh, shocks that are hitting the economy and monetary policy has to uh, deal with shocks. These are exogenous shocks that, that, that it's not a change in our mandates. It's not, uh, a, a, you know, the a, a widening of our task is still, we're still focused on monetary policy. There's a general perception, which by the way, is, is not only uh, 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 at the ECB that we discuss uh, these issues. All central banks in all countries are discussing how climate change affects their monetary policy, how it affects the uh, financial stability. All countries have been discussing uh, very actively how the pandemic uh, should uh, influence their monetary policy. And the pandemic has influenced the, the implementation of monetary policy in, in all countries. So these are shocks that uh, uh, we did not experience in the past. We were not expecting, I was not expecting the pandemic. I was not expecting the war. 
And uh, for this reason, we are now dealing with them. We cannot avoid doing that because, you know, the, uh, take the war. The war, um, to, why should the war uh, influence monetary policy? Well, because the war has increased uh, the cost of imports, which has in turn decreased disposable income because we all pay more for a number of imported goods. This affects our demand, uh, uh, increases uncertainty. So, uh, there are a number of economic consequences that we cannot ignore, and we are react reacting to those consequences. We are not uh, targeting wars or targeting pandemics. We are still targeting inflation, but inflation happens to be affected by this extreme phenomenon. Yeah, so I, I just glossed over the question, and it's almost all about the asset market, uh, about? about asset purchases and the, con and the consequences on, let's say, market liquidity. Here's, for instance, one question. Do you expect that your change in the asset purchase program, if there is a change, assuming that either it stops or it's even reduced, does this have implications um, uh, for the liquidity of these debt markets, and is that a reason to respond? Well, uh, is this part of this monetary yeah. transmission yeah. story, or is this no. separate and not part No, no, but there, there is an issue of liquidity, but uh, uh, now, given uh, the, the, the size and the structure of our uh, balance sheets, uh, we do not observe um, a reduction in liquidity, a substantial reduction in liquidity in any market segment. There may be niche, of which I uh, should look more carefully, but the financial markets are liquid. What I uh, mentioned today, and the governing council has decided, is that uh, our balance sheet will not increase. So if anything, the relative size of our balance sheet relative to uh, uh, asset markets is going to uh, uh, decrease. So if anything, liquidity is going to improve going forward. Even if our balance sheet remains constant, then of course there is a, there is a natural growth of uh, uh, um, the capitalization of uh, uh, equity markets, the, the 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 volume of bonds issued uh, by by uh, member states. So uh, for now on, uh, liquidity can only improve. Until now, it is not low. Mm -hmm. So so could you imagine that the balance sheet will shrink? Let's say if you think of ECB's balance sheet like in in two years when normalization has been somehow reached? Well, my, my argument is, first, it would be imprudent to start discussing this now. Uh, second, there is uh, no optimal, I mean, there's nothing um, uh, that is a priori preferable in a smaller or a larger balance sheet. The balance sheet will uh, evolve uh, depending on uh, the need to transmit our monetary policy. My argument today was that if we are normalizing, it would be more orderly, uh, more prudent, a uh, simpler, and simplicity in this uh, uh, moment in time is, I believe, very important. It would be preferable to act with uh, interest rates, keeping the balance sheet in this uh, point in time uh, unchanged. What will happen to the balance sheet in the future, we will see. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, it is very difficult to uh, do statements on uh, what will happen six months from now, in two years from now, I even more difficulties. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, there's one more question here. Yeah, I'll try one more. Um, this is on like hard and soft power of the ECB. So as the ECB, you can set interest rates to some degree, like you can basically say like how much a bank that puts money in your account has to pay. At the moment, it's negative. Um, but there are also um, some things that you cannot influence directly, that is more like influenced by your communication, because it's a derivative of like what people expect there will be over the next 10 years that rate. So one thing is the interest, the 10 year interest rate swap um, in the, for the Euro, which has um, increased significantly during the last four or five months. So like it went down from being almost negative uh, or like being even negative like one year ago um, to now, I think like last week it touched 200 basis points and it was a rally, which was very, very fast. So these things are derivatives, but they are real cost for banks because they, if they want to make a mortgage uh, and they want to lock in their margin, they will need to hedge that rates that they give to the customers on that day. So this thing went up very fast and maybe uh, a bit too fast. So that the question to you um, as ECB and as like using your soft power, how can you make sure that these 
market mechanisms don't overheat? How can you guide them maybe a bit more um, also in like, like a very fast rush? Um, I think this is precisely my point today. Um, we should avoid excessive enthusiasm with normalization. Normalization is a good thing if it proceeds in sync with an improvement in economic conditions and with a return of inflation to 2%. Let's not forget that until one year ago, we were fighting with deflation. The world is changing very rapidly because the shocks, uh, extreme events are happening very rapidly. But uh, a year and a half ago, the world, not only the ECB and the Euro area, was concerned about the possibility to fall in a deflationary uh, environment, which would have been uh, much more difficult to leave once you get in. So uh, we were fighting deflation. And in part, the increase of uh, long-term rates are due to the improvement in economic conditions, the return of inflation towards 2%, which was the objective we had in mind when we started our expansionary policies. Now we are getting close to target. Uh, Short-term inflation is even too high. Medium-term inflation is by and large in line with our target. So we want to avoid that there is an overshooting, that uh, in excessive, uh, can I say excessive normalization? It's an oxymoron, but let me, <laughs> an excessive normalization uh, could jeopardize the recovery. And in that case, of course, if the increase in uh, long-term yields uh, happens uh, in absence, in the absence of an improvement of economic conditions, or uh, it is not motivated by uh, uh, the anchoring of inflation expectations, that would not be good news for me. It has to proceed in sync with the improvement in economic conditions and with uh, uh, the outlook for inflation in the medium term, of course. Yeah, thank you. So let me, it's not a question. I just make a statement. <laughs> it means it's no. <laughs> a statement because, because I think what there's one issue that we haven't discussed and you haven't mentioned, but indirectly you did. Um, the discussion that has been going on for several years now of changing the inflation target has not been part of your talk. And I interpret this as, as a statement that this is not at issue, that is not at this debate any longer. The 2% in a way are taken for granted and for a longer time. The, the, there are economists, uh, you know, very well, uh, that have uh, proposed changes in the target. And there are uh, good reasons and bad reasons to do that. But certainly you cannot do it uh, when you are not at the target. So it would have been uh, mm -hmm. unwise to change the target when inflation was too low. It would be unwise now to change the target when we will be precisely on target. Inflation dynamics in the middle term will be 2%. We stabilize also short-term inflation. Expectations will be anchored at our target. Then uh, uh, it would be reasonable to discuss. I, I, at the moment, uh, I don't think it would be uh, wise and useful to start a discussion of this uh, type. We have a 2% inflation uh, target. We should uh, stick to that target. We should deliver on that. Then we can discuss many other things. But in peacetime, you discuss uh, in, uh, in uh, different situations, it's not useful. I know it's almost self-evident, but I wanted to make this yes, point. I, I understand very well. And I think we have reached our... our thank end. you very much. I want to thank you very much for your insightful talk. So I, have, I haven't read out the many comments in the chat, but they all start, thank you for the insightful um, speech. And I, I want to basically partner with them and, and thank you also. Th thank you very much, Jan. Uh, thanks to all for your attention. And uh, these discussions are useful uh, especially for those who uh, intervene, that uh, present, because it forces you to clarify your views and to well, you really understand that all those who have academic engagements know it. You really understand things when you have to explain to others, because sometimes things that don't work do not emerge until you have to explain to others. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs>